Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mary Pouton, Assistant Dean for Development at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today to our Doctors in Dialogues event. Thank you so much for joining us. A year ago, the coronavirus began to cripple our nation and our world. On the front line to fight this pandemic, the University of Maryland School of Medicine was among the first to begin testing vaccines. Our research was part of the Pfizer, the Moderna, and the Novavax vaccines. We're excited to bring to you today one of our experts, Dr. Matthew Freeman, to talk to you about all of this wonderful research. But before we begin, I'd like to note a little later in the program, you, the audience, will have the opportunity to ask questions via the chat box. Please simply select my name, Mary Pouton, in the box and type your question and hit enter to submit. And lastly, we will be recording this program. So if you'd like to view it later or share it with your friends, we'll send you that link. Our first speaker this afternoon will be Dr. E. Albert Reese, Executive Vice President for Medical Affairs at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, the John Z. and Akiko K. Bowers Distinguished Professor and Dean of the School of Medicine. So now please welcome Dean, well, Dean Reese. Thank you very much, Mary. I, I hope I'm coming across uh, being heard at this time. Welcome. Welcome to everyone who is joining us this afternoon. I wish we were together in person, uh, but under the circumstances, it's the best that we can do. And we enjoy every opportunity that we have to interact with our alumni, uh, hear from you, and hopefully you feel the same about hearing from us as well. So we have a, a program planned that we'd like to share with you. First, uh, you'll be hearing, as uh, Mary Putan just mentioned, uh, one of our distinguished faculty members, Dr. Matt Freeman. He'll be speaking to you uh, momentarily, and he'll be further introduced. But I wanted to share a few highlights about the School of Medicine. What's going on? Give you some updates that I believe uh, are always very, folks have told me in the past that they've enjoyed hearing what's happening at their school. So as, as you just heard momentarily, we have been very much involved in the in the uh, uh, this pandemic efforts. Whether it's uh, we've uh, had a statewide testing program um, using our own Institute for Genome Sciences uh, technology for high throughput testing, we've been doing vaccine development, as uh, Mary mentioned to you, and now we're doing vaccine distribution across the state. So we've been very very much deeply in, involved in in the effort. I should also mention that most recently, one of our own faculty members, uh, Dr. Wilbur Chen, who's a professor in the Department of Medicine, was selected to be selected by the U United States Health and Human Services, the HHS, to serve on an advisory committee on immunization practices. This is a very important critical board that makes decision on immunization and vaccines over the uh, over a four-year term, which he will serve. It is really one where the experts make recommendation on the safety of vaccines for America. In addition, the governor uh, had his task force on uh, vaccines and uh, the entire COVID, COVID uh, matter. And two of our own faculty uh, are members of that task force, Dr. David Marcosi from the Department of Emergency Medicine and Dr. Wilbur Chen from the Department of, of uh, Internal Medicine. Now, you, you know that in addition to the fact that most of us are eager to have the vaccine available and ready and in our arms because we really want to see the end of this uh, pandemic, there are some who have vaccine hesitancy. And so uh, a few weeks ago, we put out a program that involved Tony Fauci was a member of the team and we have had several faith leaders as part of the team, as well as some of our own scientists. And that was a very well-received event with over 2,000 uh, attendees on this Zoom Facebook uh, webinar. But most importantly, it was one where we could share in a very open, open fashion the, how the vaccine was developed, the fact that it was really a, a rather diverse population uh, we were members of the, the uh, vaccine testing uh, site. 
where we made specific efforts to include uh, uh, various ethnic and racial groups. And so it was, we had a, a number of questions and we believe that we made an impact in allaying some of the, the fears and concerns uh, of many individuals. I should also mention to you again that your school, School of Medicine continues to do well despite the pandemic. We have been working relentlessly. So our many programs that we have are programs of excellence. And you may, you may remember that we do have a comprehensive multi-organ, multi-solid organ transplant program. At the present time, we're doing about 350 transplants per year, five different organs. And this is a national and sometimes international uh, transplant program with patients coming from across the nation and in some cases across the world a comprehensive cardiovascular medicine surgery program, again, of that same magnitude. Many of you know from your time here that shock trauma, the R. Adam Cowley Shock Trauma Center, continues to thrive and continues to be that, that beacon of excellence that the world looks to when there, are, when there are trauma patients needing expert care. It's been expanded not just to trauma, but trauma and critical care medicine and surgery. There's the Cancer Center, a, the NIH designated Cancer Center. And let me just give you an example. There are about uh, uh, over a thousand cancer centers nationwide, and about 40 approximately are designated by the NIH as comprehensive cancer centers where there are research and discoveries that really fuel and inform patient care. We, we have been designated for the past decade as one of those comprehensive cancer centers. So there are just many programs that we consider to be our destination programs where patients will travel all over the, the nation to really receive care here. I wanna to touch a little bit on education. Education continues to be obviously our bedrock. That's how we began in 18, 1807 and we continue to make that a, a prominent part of what we do. Most recently, we had a complete revision of our curriculum, and now we've called it the Renaissance Curriculum. The last time we had such a comprehensive review was in the 1990s. So this has been quite substantial. The essence of this is really where we are, we are reducing the large auditoria where we're giving large lectures to hundreds of students and focusing more on small classrooms subject-based uh, education. For example, as you know, many of you went through this, the, this in, 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 the, in the medical school where the first year is mostly about normal anatomy, normal histology, normal biology. And the second year geared more toward the, the complicated, the disease states. Well, with the Renaissance curriculum, we've begun to teach them together. So essentially they may look at the heart, and study the normal and the abnormal and the disease state, or the lung, the normal and the disease state. So that has become a very, very robust uh, uh, transformation. And one thing that I want to just leave you with, and so we have reduced the first two years to about one and a half years by doing it that way. But a, a, an exciting part that we've done is as opposed to having the basic science all in the first two years, we now have in the last year, a really exciting thing called back to basics. So we're introducing some basic science towards the end. So when, when students leave, they are very, very much enriched. The last point I wanna make is about the role that philanthropy pays, uh, plays. You know, from being here so many years, that although we are a state institution, 4%, 4% of our operating budget comes from the state. So 96% of our operating budget has to be raised in various ways, either clinical care, research uh, overhead, gifts uh, from others, and of course, uh, tuition and fees. So essentially, the role that you've played, the support that you have provided to the school has been extraordinarily helpful. Helpful in providing scholarships, maybe merit scholarship, diversity scholarships, or setting up endowments. Very, very, I cannot emphasize how important your gifts and your support have been over the years. And I just wanna use this as an opportunity to thank each of you for what you've done 
in just shoring up your, your, your alma mater, ensuring that your alma mater continues to be strong, robust, and as a consequence, we are indeed one of the leading research centers in America, uh, in the top echelon of all medical schools nationwide. This is a combination of our own efforts, but also your support. And I believe that combination has served us well. So let me close by thanking you once again for joining us. Thank you for spending time with us this afternoon. And I can say that our next speaker, Dr. Matthew Freeman, I'm absolutely confident that you'll be very impressed with what he has to present. He's one of our shining stars. He's done a great job with uh, what he's doing in, in vaccine development. And you will hear from him in a moment. So thank you for being with us. And I hope you enjoy the time we spent together. Thanks. Thank you, Dean Reese. The School of Medicine is proud of our strong partnership with our Medical Alumni Association. So I'd like to invite the association's executive director, Larry Pitra, to, be, to bring greetings on behalf of the MAA. Larry. Well, thank you, Mary. You know, it's always horrible to follow Dr. Reese because every time you do, he said everything that needs to be said remarkably well, and you're left picking up the pieces. So what I'll just say is, Dr. Reese, I really like your bow tie today. Um, <laughs> I want to welcome everyone on behalf of the Alumni Association. It's wonderful to see uh, so many names, so many familiar names. And I too want to echo uh, Dr. Reese's uh, thanks for all the philanthropic support we've received from you over the uh, past several years. Um, Dr. Reese delivered an excellent, uh, very brief update. He's going to be doing that again during our uh, virtual reunion that you'll be hearing about very shortly. We're just pulling together all the details for that. There'll be a medical school update as well as a, uh, a curricular uh, update by one of our um, uh, faculty members from Student Affairs, uh, Dr. Joseph Martinez, who actually uh, was a student, a first year student, the last time our curriculum was reformed back in 1994-95. So with that, uh, I'm looking forward to this presentation too by Dr. Freeman. Welcome everyone. Glad you're here. Thanks again for your support. And uh, we'll be in touch with you real soon. Thank you, Larry, appreciate it. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you our presenter this afternoon, Dr. Matthew Freeman. Dr. Freeman is an Associate Professor of Microbiology and Immunology here at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. He has spent his career studying the replication and pathogenesis of coronaviruses and has been carefully studying SARS-CoV-2 in his secure laboratory since last February. He has also been responsible for leading research regarding repurposing FDA approved drugs for COVID-19 antiviral therapy. Dr. Freeman and his research team have played key roles in developing monoclonal antibodies in partnership with Regeneron and AstraZeneca, Polyclonal Sera with Emergent Biosolutions and vaccines with Novavax. Dr. Freeman's important work continues as the evaluation of, of viral variants and drug combinations come to the forefront of the next phase of this pandemic. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Matthew Freeman. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm happy to be here and, and to share some of the information that we're working on in the lab. Um, Please uh, ask questions along the way. I know there's a lot of questions about uh, SARS-2 and COVID-19, um, but what I'll focus on today is some of the vaccine work that we've been doing in the lab with Novavax, which I think is uh, quite topical and really um, important for where we are in the pandemic. So let's see if I can share that. Can you see those slides? Great. Um, so I'll start here. And, and uh, as Mary said, my I've been a coronavirus researcher for my entire career for my postdoc at UNC, um, and now my, um, I guess, almost 12 years now at University of Maryland. The focus of the lab initially was on SARS coronavirus 1, which is what, what emerged in 2003. Then we merged into um, those, the, the, a new model um, for MERS coronavirus, which emerged in 2012 in Saudi Arabia. And now we're working on SARS coronavirus 2. And really the whole uh, host of this response, um, even this year, we really base all of our work on basic virology and basic cell biology. So we work on really both aspects of this response, looking at the um, way the virus replicates in cells. Um, uh, just a cartoon here on the left, how it enters cells, how it replicates and uses the host machinery for replication and how it leaves the cell. 
And then also we use um, mouse models to identify how the disease, uh, each of these diseases causes uh, uh, pathogenesis in mice, uh, really understanding the host response, the host genes in the lungs, as well as the inflammatory response. And really the goal uh, and the way I think about studying these viruses is that we really want to understand the whole aspects of this virus, um, of this entire family of coronaviruses, and that we can leverage all of our previous work on SARS-1 and MERS to really understand SARS-2. Um, so this is a brief snapshot of the lab. They did really the bulk of the work um, with me in the BSL-3. Um, uh, this is us having a socially distanced uh, visit outside when they all dressed up like me one day. Um, we had a lab party for one of our papers being published. Um, and, uh, and it's really them that are really uh, are the hallmark of the lab uh, in the work that I'm going to show you. Uh, really, the, the Novavax project for the vaccination was managed by um, Rob Halp, the PhD student in the lab, um, as well as Jimmy Logue. Uh, and Marissa McGrath, two other new PhD students um, uh, in the lab. And so uh, I think all good things start with an origin story. So I'll give you the bit of SARS-2 origin stories for the lab. So all of this outbreak really started to the world um, uh, with this very strange ProMed post uh, on December 31st last year. And so I tweeted this out to friends, um, basically saying that there was this, uh, the report saying there's this undiagnosed pneumonia uh, identified in the Wuhan, um, in, in the city of Wuhan in, in, in the Hubei province in China. And this is, as a coronavirus researcher, we see these reports all the time of these strange pneumonias that occur all over the world. Um, sometimes they're initially linked to a coronavirus and oftentimes they're, they, most of the time they don't really come out to anything. And so I posted that maybe um, this was SARS and worth a follow to all of my fellow coronavirus researchers. Um, and then this was, you can see the date, New Year's Eve 2019. I spent most of the day, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the day before New Year's, um, using Google Translate to read uh, Chinese press releases, trying to figure out what was going on in Hubei and see if it was anything interesting. Um, and obviously it turned out to be uh, SARS coronavirus too. And so uh, all of January, we really spent trying to understand and get connections and talk to colleagues about this virus, get information from China. Um, the first patient in the U.S. was identified at the end of January, um, January 22nd, and then we received an isolate from colleagues at the CDC uh, from this first Washington State patient, uh, February 9th. And then since then, we've really um, been working full force on uh, understanding this virus, trying to develop therapeutics for this and get things out of the lab and into the, um, into the clinic as fast as possible. So as you know, the virus that we're talking about is SARS coronavirus 2. It causes the disease called COVID-19 or coronavirus disease 2019. Um, and really the one of the really kind of remarkable things about this virus uh, to me as a virologist is that it really caused this wide spectrum of illness. So we're seeing a virus that the population is essentially almost completely naive to um, as it spreads very rapidly through the population. Um, people have, have, have disease from either asymptomatic disease uh, where they're infected and they don't know it and they have no symptoms at all, to losing their smell and taste and having anosmia, um, to really this wide spectrum of clinical disease where we have mild all the way to severe and lethal respiratory illness, yesterday passing 500,000 deaths in just the United States alone. Um, and in people who have severe disease, we, the, they come, out with, come down with pneumonia. Uh, there's this strange coagulopathy, which we don't really understand. Um, and then this very unusual long hauler syndrome where people can be infected and normal, normal population clears the virus uh, in, uh, in one to two weeks. But they have symptoms that last much longer, months and months, um, that is really unknown at the moment. And it's something we're interested in looking in for in the future. So this is what this virus looks like, um, a cartoon, but this is what the cryo-EM of the structure looks like, um, all put together by, um, uh, uh, by colleagues at Scripps. One of the important things here is that um, it, inside this virion, it's a spherical virion, is where the genome is, is compacted with the nuclear, nuclear capsid protein. And then on the outside of the virus, these orange lollipop structures are the spike protein. And the reason this is important is these are the immunodominant antigens. This is what your body sees when you get infected, and it's what all the vaccines are directed to um, uh, out of all the vaccines that have been approved or uh, are, are being worked on in phase two and three trials. And so my lab has really worked on a whole host of things over the last year. It's kind of dizzying actually to, to think about all the projects we've been in the midst of. Um, everything from looking at vaccines and antibodies that, uh, with Novavax and Emergent AstraZeneca, as well as uh, Dr. Mosujadi here at IHV, um, and then a new uh, developing collaboration with Ofer Levy at Boston Children's on a, a new vaccine project. We've worked with companies looking at 
targeting the virus directly, looking at proteases and uh, polymerase targets with uh, groups at Pfizer, um, as well as our, our BARDA and DARPA um, collaborations, as well as now also looking at host factors. So really taking, not looking at the virus directly, but looking at, at host proteins that are important for replicating not just SARS-2, but MERS and SARS-1 and potentially other viruses as well. And we have a really nice um, uh, uh, collaborator, Aikido Pharma, which has uh, funded one of the projects in the lab, as well as Sumit Chanda and Nevin Krogan, two of the colleagues out in California, um, in San Diego and, and San Francisco, that we are now working on host factors that are important for replication. And so I'll tell you about the, um, uh, the vaccine work we've been doing with Novavax. I think it's, it's actually quite topical and, and, and really probably the most important thing we've done ever in my career uh, so far. And so, uh, as you know, there's multiple vaccines that have been uh, developed through the Operation Warp Speed and through the trials. Um, they're shown here. We won't go over all the different types, but you've obviously heard about the Moderna and the Pfizer-BioNTech um, vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, which are, have received e, um, EUA approval and have been dosing everyone around the country. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is an adenovirus backbone vaccine. It is due to be um, discussed at the FDA uh, on Friday. So we may have another vaccine in the midst uh, for approval very soon. And then we've been working with Novavax, which is just a little behind their, uh, their UK and South Africa trial, which I'll tell you about at the end, uh, has been completed for phase three trials. And they're now in the midst of their US trial uh, where they've now completed the enrollment of 30,000 patients in this trial already in the US after about a month um, of enrollment, including the standard vaccine development here um, in their, in, is, is part of that trial. And so our work with Novavax really started earlier than just last year. Um, we've been working with them since 2015 on a MERS vaccine, and I'm not going to show you any of the data on that, but we developed a MERS vaccine with them, which when the technology is basically the exact same technology that we used for, with them for their, um, their SARS coronavirus 2 vaccine. And so this just goes to this idea that it's really a basic science behind this. It's building models. It's understanding the virus that can leverage our ability to respond faster and faster um, in the future. And so this is just an email from Gail Smith uh, from Novavax, who is our, our, our colleague there that's been running their, um, their vaccine design work. And so he's responding to an email from 2018 to me. Um, this email is on January 21st and been basically saying, hey, there's this virus out there. Um, are you interested in working with us again? And so we, of course, said yes, and we've been working with them ever since. So one of the really important things that have come out of the field over the last five to six years is really understanding more about this spike protein on the outside of the virus. And so this is work by Jason McClellan, um, who was a, a colleague of me in grad school. Now he's at, uh, at UT, um, UT Austin. Uh, and what he's done has been has produced very fine structures of what the spike protein looks like. So it doesn't really look like a lollipop. It's a trimer. And so this cryo-EM structure is these three lollipop structures together. Um, and what he's really been able to do is to understand um, how this, this machine works. It's not just a, a static protein. Um, it actually goes under a large change when, it, when the virus binds the cells to enter. And so what he's been, he's been able to do is identify um, amino acids that keep the structure the same on the outside of the virus, so this locked mutations. And so that's what was put into the Novavax vaccine. These are these mutations he identified down here. Um, there's other mutations upstream of this um, in the spike protein. This is just a picture of the spike uh, drawn out. Um, and this is what Novavax used. And we worked with them developing different versions of this spike protein for their vaccine, trying to show which ones really had the most immunogenicity in, in animal studies. This is their vaccine down here, um, another cryo-EM structure um, on the left, and then the reconstruction on the right really showing this structure that it looks similar to the other protein that I showed you before, but it has this really rigid locked in structure. Um, you can see at the top down version here, this trimer in red, green, and blue. And what this is, this cryo-EM is showing for Andy Ward's lab of the exact vaccine that we used, it's going in people, um, is it has a really compact structure. And I left out all the biophysical data, but this was used, this is important because it's much more stable um, uh, in temperature than some of the mRNA vaccines, which need really cold minus 80 or minus 20 freezers. The Novavax vaccine is very stable at four degrees and even room temperature for a while, um, uh, lending itself to this, this very basic science idea at the beginning where they, we figured out exactly what would be the right structure for um, designing a vaccine. So we work with them on animal studies. I just put a little bit of the data here. Um, this is our mouse data that was been uh, published in Nature Communications earlier this year. Um, on the left here, it's just showing that the lower bars here are 
are less virus in the lungs. Um, on the left-hand side is two doses, on the right is one dose uh, across a dose range of, of vaccine. And all this I wanted to show you here was that what we were able to show is using the, really the basic models in the lab, um, in mice, this vaccine is incredibly potent, uh, especially after two doses. And on the right, you may uh, remember this from anatomy class if you're uh, not looking at lung slides all the time now as part of your career. On the right-hand side is what a mouse lung looks like normally. Um, you have the bronchi here with really nice epithelial cell layers. The vasculature is very open and clear, and there's very little inflammation around the blood vessels in the lung. The alveoli are very open um, and have single cell uh, uh, distances around the alveolar space. In the placebo-infected mice, we see really substantial inflammation. All of these places in the lung, um, from the bronchi to the, the blood vessels and the, are, um, and the alveoli are filled with inflammatory cells, and this is the, res the, the response of the mouse to infection. Um, but this is the higher dose virus here, the 10 microgram dose. You can see it really reduces a lot of inflammation. And correlating that with our virus titer data shows that this vaccine, it was the first time uh, this vaccine had been seen in, in animals um, in April, that the vaccine really does protect these mice from disease. So this work has been followed up um, in the future, in, in, uh, since then in other animal studies. They did, we did baboon and macaque work with them. We didn't do the infections here, but the infections were done other places. We helped them analyze the data, look at virus load, and look at uh, the amount of antibody that's produced there. And in both of these studies, just like we saw in mice, we get very high amounts of antibody being produced um, after, uh, after vaccination. Um, you can see in the baboon study, over time, you have increasing amounts of antibody uh, after two doses of vaccination, which is uh, what we want to see. And in macaques, we can see very high amounts of neutralizing antibody, even higher than the convalescent sera, which is on the right-hand side here, um, meaning that we even get better response than some uh, patients who were infected previously uh, um, in, in, uh, in these cohorts in these hospital settings. And all of this is fine looking at antibody data. What we really want to know is, uh, does, the, does the vaccine protect animals uh, and humans eventually from, um, from infection? And so these studies were done in baboon and macaques. I'm just showing you the baboon data here where animals were vaccinated. They were then infected with um, actually a quite high dose of SARS coronavirus 2. And then their nasal swabs and BAL fluid was taken and then analyzed for the amount of virus that's in those, in those samples. And at, even after challenge, even in the, in the lowest dose, um, we see only one animal that had a uh, positive uh, detectable virus genome um, in the lowest dose of vaccine, but it really was sterilizing, uh, almost sterilizing immunity in these animals looking at virus load, both in the BAL fluid as well as the nasal swabs. And so this gives us a good idea that, what, that this vaccine is going to be very effective in humans. And all of this study was basically going on in the midst of trials that Novax has been running in their phase one trial, phase two, and eventually phase three trial in the UK and South Africa. And so the phase three trial data from the UK has been, um, has been released uh, um, in uh, January, late December. And so this is just, this is some of the data from that trial. I figured I, I would show you what it looks like in real humans. Um, uh, all of these endpoints were, were taken during the trial and then after about 150, um, 100 cases, then the trial was unblinded so they could tell which group the uh, cases were in. And so um, what was very uh, nice to see and which was supported by all the animal data is in, in the placebo vaccinated group, um, there was uh, 56 total cases. And these cases are read out as, uh, as um, moderate to severe illness in the uh, endpoint data. Uh, whereas in the vaccinated group, only six cases were there. Um, and so when you calculate it out, it's an 89.3% efficacy rate. Uh, in this population. Um, this was almost 14 or 15,000 people in this trial. The other really interesting part of this trial was that it was going on as one of these new variants, which we'll talk about in a second, was accruing this B117, this UK variant. And, um, and so everyone in the trial actually was infected, uh, or greater than 50% of the people were infected with this B117 or this 501YV1 mutant. Um, and it, the vaccine was still highly efficacious about against that vaccine, against that variant that's uh, accruing and actually spreading the United States right now. The data is quite interesting when they did a small trial in South Africa. So this is only 4,000 or 4,500 uh, patients. Um, but what they found was that uh, it was a little less effective in the trial. So when they had HIV positive and negative populations, if you look at the total efficacy, it was around 50% um, 
efficacy in these patients. Um, but what was going on in South Africa at the time uh, was that as viruses were being sequenced, they realized that there was this new clade of virus um, called 501YV2, or the South Africa variant, that was accruing in this population. And um, uh, almost everyone that was in the vaccinated group that was positive for, this, uh, for, for symptoms was infected with the South Africa variant. Um, and so it's quite interesting to see how these variants are going to affect disease in the future and spread of, the, of even vaccinated people. And we're working with Novax now uh, to determine that with their new vaccine, which is against the South Africa variant. And this is showing you one of the, the, the um, these clade diagrams that you can see over time. Uh, these swoops are new variants that are accruing. And so this is what was happening during their trial is that in South Africa, you were accruing this new 501YV2 variant, um, which is really what overcome and it has mutations that escape uh, some of the neutralization capabilities of this vaccine. And just to give you a, a brief snapshot of on the last slide of what's going on in California right now, um, uh, there's a new variant in California, you may have heard in the news, uh, the California variant, um, it's called B1429. It is now over um, 50% of all sequenced isolates out uh, across California. And the worry is that this is now spreading um, potentially like one of these other UK or the South Africa variant in the population. There's no evidence yet that it is more transmissible or it escapes the uh, vaccines that have been developed so far, but it's certainly something we're looking at and we're starting to do neutralizing antibody studies in the lab with this isolate now, as well as South Africa and the UK variant to really determine um, uh, if there is breakthrough for any of the vaccines or antibodies we're working on. So. Um, over the year, we've worked with a lot of collaborators and we're continuing this work uh, for antibodies and drugs and vaccines. And it's been um, really quite uh, amazing to have uh, a way to connect our basic science work in the lab and to understand what's going on at the virus standpoint, inform all of these vaccine and drug studies, um, as well as see how we can get these things out into the clinic as fast as possible. So I'm there and thank everyone who did all the work. So really it's a whole as a whole uh, a holistic lab response for all these projects, but Rob uh, helped to graduate the lab, led the vaccine work. Um, Jimmy and Marissa did a lot of the neutralizing antibody work. Um, and then we have great collaborators at Novavax, Greg Glenn and uh, Gail Smith, who are leading the, the charge there with uh, Stanley Urk, the CEO of Novavax. Um, but we have really nice funding now from a lot of places, from companies, but also from uh, NIH and DARPA and BARDA and the Gates Foundation to really drive the next phase of therapeutics that we're working on in the lab. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. Um, wonderful um, presentation and informative. Um, I, uh, the first question is, what made you decide to start studying coronaviruses? <laughs> uh, you know, life is strange sometimes. So um, the honest truth is that I was, uh, uh, I was finishing my PhD at, at Johns Hopkins. I was looking for labs to go to. My wife was an MD PhD student at UNC Chapel Hill. And I was, um, I was looking for labs to work in and I interviewed with five or six different, different uh, professors. And um, there was this really nice guy who worked on coronaviruses. It was right after SARS-1 emerged. And I thought this could be something kind of interesting that it's worth looking at. And I worked in Ralph Barrick's lab and uh, everything kind of went from there. So perfect timing. You've spent your career on this field of study and and now you're right in the middle of fighting the pandemic. Certainly been very strange uh, curve since <laughs> I started. Um, so you talked about Novavax and, um, you know, the point in which it is held, it doesn't have to be so cold. Do you think that obviously will be um, uh, the ability to be able to um, get it into farther areas of the world that are harder to reach? The, do they expect to try to distribute it more widely because of that ability? Yeah, I, I think so. I think it, it's a really important point for all of these vaccines is, the, is to get it not just, you know, in Baltimore or San Francisco or, or you know, New York. It's to get it as far and wide as possible. It's the only way we're going to manage this, um, this outbreak is by getting as many people vaccinated as possible and trying to reduce the amount of virus out there. And so not having this strict cold chain is certainly very important. Um, one of the really nice things, you know, not to be a, to sell Novavax, but one of the nice things they're doing also is 
They're working with um, COVAX, which is this global vaccine initiative to get vaccine into um, uh, into underdeveloped countries. Uh, and so they've they promised a billion vac a billion doses. Uh, they're one of the, the large centers that they're making vaccine doses in, is in India. Um, and so they're really expanding and their distribution network around the world. So um, I'm hoping you know we can be part of this vaccine that is in the most arms uh, you know across the globe. But we'll certainly see how that goes. And there's a question about clarification and when they expect this to prop to be FDA approved to be um, use and are they already in production of this vaccine? Oh, good. So for the first point, uh, the trials, the phase three trial is ongoing. I have no inside information about when that trial will be over and read. Um, it's been reported that it'll be sometime probably in April or May um, by the time they accrue cases and then and then, uh, and divulge the data to the FDA. For the, to speed up the process, they are um, the FDA has a uh, is basically gets a read on the data on a weekly basis. So they start seeing everything ahead of time instead of waiting to the end. And Novavax don't giving them all the data at one time, so that will speed up the approval process. We um, we hope um, on the on the second part about production. Um, one of We're having technical difficulties with Dr. Freeman. Hopefully he'll be able to get on again soon. This is uh, the reality of the Zoom meeting um, currently. So hopefully um, we'll give him just a minute to see if Dr. Freeman can get back on here. Coming back on right now. So I think we've regained Dr. Freeman. Oh, sorry about that. I will. I switched to my phone. There was my computer internet connection stopped for a second. How about that? All right. We see you. All right. Let me stand up and do it this way. Um, so uh, I think what I was saying was that the um, one of the remarkable things about the vaccine response was that um, they were producing doses already. So the goal for Novavax is to, um, and all these companies make as many as possible as fast as they can. Um, the goal for Novavax is stated that they want a billion doses by the fall um, with another 2 billion doses in, in um, next year. So I think it will be, um, you know, the scale up is already happening. And, and for all of these companies, the, they're producing doses no matter what. And so um, all that production is in, in progress now. All right, great, you made it back with us, thank you. Also, how are you assessing T cell functionality in the various vaccine responses? And the second half of the question is, might there be better cross reactivity at the T cell level across variants? It's a great question. I took all the T cell data out. I didn't know, I think I would have enough time. Um, uh, so we are doing, a, there is a lot of T cell work as well as just neutralizing antibody work for all of these vaccines. Um, for this one in particular, there's been a lot of T cell work done for uh, in the baboons and the macaque model. Um, we haven't done much on the mouse side, but that'll be changing when we do the variant studies now. Um, and so there is, there is substantial um, uh, T cell activation that we're seeing when we look at um, both T effector and T follicular helpful cell. If you're interested in, in the data, I can share it with you. Um, but we are assessing T cell response. And, and one of the goals, is, especially for the T cell side, is that this, uh, the adjuvant that's in the Novavax vaccine, this matrix M1, is really important for driving the, that um, the mature T cell and then memory B cell response. So um, that's certainly part of it. And, and we think that will help cover a lot of the variants um, in the future, which has been somewhat lacking um, uh, in other vaccines. Also, the question is, um, of course, as these variants are coming out, um, do you think this would be a vaccine um, that would be needed every year? It's a very good question, and, and we certainly don't know the answer yet. Um, uh, what I'm so we're in the midst of doing variant testing with Novavax right now. Um, we're also testing Sierra for Moderna and Pfizer uh, through NIH against these variants. Um, and so, what we're seeing so far is that uh, there is a loss of neutralizing antibody. It's not total, but it is it is present when we start looking at the South Africa variant. So it helps explain the clinical data in the phase three in the in the trial there. Um, and the variants certainly, you know, they're, they're, they're certainly a sign that we will need boosters in the future. Um, the goal is that the less people that get infected, the less variants will be out in the wild because um, less the, the, the virus needs people to replicate the virus in, that's how you get the variants. Um, 
What is really going to be interesting, though, is as pe more people get zero converted and we watch this go through um, the population, will, the, will there be variants being pushed away in the immune response? They start evading the response as a way just to survive. If you're a virus, you, you, that's all you want to do is replicate. Um, and so there, there, there certainly could be boosters needed in the future. Um, and the more we know about the variants and we will follow the, vet, the virus in the vaccine trials um, to sequence virus that comes out of positive patients, the more we'll understand exactly the trajectory um, of the spike protein and what mutations are there. And that'll help us guide future uh, vaccines. So it may look like flu vaccine in the future where um, every one or two years we need a booster to cover the new variants that are there. Um, that's certainly one avenue that we predict this might take. Um, and um, what area do you think um, would, are you still working on antiviral drugs and, and um, for treatments? And are there any new antiviral drugs that are currently being looked at? So we do, we do have a large drug project in the lab. Um, we're doing both repurposed drugs. So looking at FDA approved drugs and finding ones that, um, that's so signatures of protection in cells. Um, and we've done a whole host of screens, uh, almost a thousand drug screens so far. Um, we now, in, in, in cell lines, we're now moving toward human lung organoid systems using this lung and a chip system to try to look for um, which of those really works and what, are the, what is the key signatures of protection in those kind of drugs. Um, and then we'll be testing those in animals now in mice and then hamsters with a colleague for our DARPA project. Um, the next phase for us is looking at combinations. And so single drug therapies are really difficult for any virus. We still know for HIV, you need a cocktail of drugs. And I think that seems to be what the most effective route is gonna be for uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so we're now doing uh, combination therapies with remdesivir and another oral nucleoside analog called EIDD-2801, uh, which is really highly active as an oral drug. Um, and we're testing those in combination with some of the other drugs that we've come out of the screens. Um, and then any of those that are um, effective in animals and in cells, we then have the opportunity to go to clinical trials after that. So that's, it's all in the works. Sounds like there's a lot in the works. It's been a busy year. <laughs> all right. Um, is there, are there any other comments you'd like to make? That's the end of our questions for this afternoon. Um, I, I guess what I, you know, I hopefully what you saw and what I try to emphasize and, and in my talks is that um, you know I'm not a clinician, but and I think that all of the the basic science work that goes into studying these viruses is incredibly important. Um, you know, I I think that especially uh, I mean I, I think the medical community appreciates this, and I think communicating all of this to the lay po population is um, is important to to not just you know why people should get vaccinated, but um, uh, but what it does to the population and 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 how to support science in the future. So. Hopefully I can, I, I've spoken to some of that today. Right, and I guess it helps that we've had a Center for Vaccine Development for over 40 years, and we've been a, a leader in vaccine development. So that's helped us stay at the forefront this year. Absolutely. All right, thank you, Dr. Freeman. That um, is the end of our presentation. Thank you, Dr. Reese and Larry for also, um, Larry Petroff for joining us. Um, thank you for you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at a future Doctor in Dialogue event. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.